this function is pretty simple. First, we have two parameters right here that specify what kind of type of pipe should be created and which cell it belongs to. Then we have a few variables. The variable pipe image is set to be equal to a string where we replace percent %s with the value of the type parameter. If the type value is straight, then the string will say straight-pipe.png. This is then the image that the pipe should use from the images folder. The pipe endpoints variable is set to be equal to the different endpoints that this type of pipe can connect with. We grab them by referring to the pipe types dictionary at the index of the type parameters value. If it's equal to straight, then we'll be grabbing the value in the dictionary with the key straight. The value will be a tuple object with endpoint values, so we'll convert it into a list as we assign it to the pipe endpoints variable. This will then allow us to override values in the list as the pipe rotates, which we can't do with tuples. Next, we add these variables we just created into a new list called final pipe. We also add its cell and current rotation value, as all of these details are things we will need to know about the pipe later on. Then lastly, we add this final pipe list into the pipes list. If this function has only run once before to add one pipe to the list, then it might look like this. Here we can see that the pipes list is indicated with the outer square brackets, and the inner square brackets is the list item that represents the pipe we just added. If we were to add another pipe, it may look like this. Now we have two lists inside the pipes list with information about the two different pipes. So now we've looked at all the functions that the setup pipe game function calls in order to set up the game. These were the functions generate create path, create pipes, and create pipe. And these were all we needed in order to create a path and pipes to fill the grid with. Now we're going to have a look at the actual minigame screen where we create the pipes using image buttons based on the information in the pipes list. In this screen, we first have a background image, and then we have the grid displayable that will be filled with the pipe image buttons. The grid has some normal styling properties to place it where we want it in the game, and spacing is set to zero, as we don't want any gaps between the pipes. Now to place each pipe in the grid, we'll use a for loop again. This time, we'll loop through the pipes list, which means in each run of the loop, an item is going to be selected from the list and accessible in the pipe variable. It starts at the first pipe and ends in the last one. Then inside the for loop, we'll now create an image button this table. First, we want to know if the current pipe in the loop also exists in the connected pipes list, because if it has been connected with other pipes leading back to the starting point, then we want to indicate that to the player. For that, we instead use the blue version of the image that the image button uses. So with these if statements, we simply check if the pipe exists in the list, and if it does, we use the blue version of the image, and if it doesn't, we use the normal version. You might have noticed that the image button team aren't using normal images as the children. Instead, we've got a transform displayable, which is also a valid type to use. Normally, when you want to transform an image button or other type of displayable, such as to rotate them, we create a transform and apply it to the displayable with the add statement. In this case, we would want the transform to keep changing its rotation value every time the player clicks on the image button. But in RenPy, transforms don't really work that well with values that changes throughout the game, and as such, we have to find another way of getting the image button to rotate on demand. So for this, we instead create a new transform displayable as the child of the image button. When the player then clicks on it, its action runs, which in turn causes the screen to update. The action runs a function that causes the rotation value to change, and since we are running the transform function here, every time the screen runs, a new transform will be created and therefore it will use whatever the rotation value is at the time. Here we set the image of the transform as the first parameter. Since the image path is stored in the first item of the pipes list, we access it by adding a zero inside the square brackets. Then the rotation value is stored at index position 4. We also set the rotate pad property to false to make sure the image rotates without extra padding. The action for the image button, as I mentioned earlier, calls a custom function. This one is called rotate pipe and takes one parameter called cell. This should be equal to the cell which the pipe resides in and is stored at the index position of 3 in the pipes list. And that's all the code in this screen. Let's now have a look at this rotate function to see how it works. So here we have the rotate pipe function which takes one parameter called cell and should contain the value of the cell that has the pipe you want to rotate. In here we have an if statement and an else statement as well as two function calls. 
this function simply makes sure the rotation value of the pipe in the pipe list is increased by 90, which means the pipe should rotate 90 degrees each time. Now if we only continuously add 90 to the rotation value every time the player rotates the pipe, then we would increasingly get a larger number. But we don't really need to make the value too large, so for that we have an if statement right here that says if the rotation value is equal to 360, then we continue from 90 again instead. And that we do by simply setting the rotation value to 90. But if it's not, then we can just continue adding 90 to the value. Now that we have done that, we need to remember that the pipe's endpoints are going to be placed differently. If the pipe was straight, for example, and its endpoints was left and right, it will now instead be top and bottom. So to fix that, we run another function called update pipe endpoints. After that, we then run another function called check pipe connections, which will check if the rotation of this pipe allowed it to be connected with other pipes that goes back to the starting point. First, let's have a look at the update pipe endpoints function to see how it works. This function takes one parameter called cell. When you call this function from elsewhere in the script, you need to supply this parameter with the cell of the pipe that was rotated, so the function can identify and grab the correct one from the pipes list. Then inside the function, we have a for loop that iterates through the pipes list. Inside it, we check if the current pipe in the loop resides in the same cell as the value stored in the cell parameter. If it does, then we have identified the correct pipe to update. Inside of that, we have another for loop that iterates through this pipe's endpoints list. Then inside that loop, we check with if statements if the current endpoint is top, right, bottom, or left. If the current endpoint is equal to top, we need to set it to right because we have rotated the pipe 90 degrees clockwise. To do that, we first identify at which index position this endpoint resides in the list, and then we can update the value in the list at that index. Then we continue the same way for the other if statements, but make them elif statements instead. Once the second for loop has finished, we have completed the update for the pipe, so we can therefore stop it from running. So for that, we break the loop with the break statement. This statement needs to be in the same indentation as the second for loop, so right here, in order for this to work correctly. And that is all the code necessary for this function. Let's have a look at the check pipe connections function now as well, that we make a call to as the last thing in the rotate pipe function. The first thing we do in this function is to reset the connected pipes list. For that, we set it to an empty list and remember to declare it as a global at the top of the function. Then in the code that comes after, we're going to fill this list with the pipes that are connected to the starting point. That means that the first pipe in the grid must be connected to the starting point to the left to be added to the list. Then any other pipes that connects to it will also be added. We're also going to apply another rule here, which is that we can't allow any pipe with a loose endpoint to be able to continue the connection, because in this case, we assume that liquid would pour out of it, and therefore the connection would be invalid. With that said, the first thing we'll check is if the first pipe has a left endpoint. If it does, then it's rotated correctly, and we can add it to the list. Since this function will run every time we rotate a pipe, we need to make sure we don't keep adding the first pipe to the list, as long as this if statement is true. So for that, we have this second condition that says pipes at the index of zero, not in connected pipes. So as long as the first pipe is not already in the connected pipes list, then we go ahead and add it. After that, we have another if statement that checks if we have at least one item in the list, and if that item is the first pipe in the grid. If that is true, then we can continue checking for other pipes that may be connected to it. So in here, we have a for loop that runs through each pipe in the connected pipes list. In the first run of the loop, we only have one item so far, so the loop would only run once until another item gets added below. That means that it will keep running as the list gets larger until a point where no more items are added. According to the rules, we only want to add a pipe to the list if it connects to a previously connected pipe and if it doesn't have any loose endpoints. For that, we start out by checking if the current pipe in the connection so far is in the first column, but it's not the first pipe and it has an endpoint to the left. If this is true, then we have a problem because the pipe is leaking. In this case, we don't want to continue to check for other pipes that connects with this pipe, so we simply break the loop to stop it from continuing. Now that we have covered that scenario, we continue checking for others. In the next if statement, we check if the current pipe in the connection so far is not in the last column, so it could be any pipe before the last column. This sort of pipe could connect with the pipe to the right, so for that we check if it has a right connection, and then inside the if block we check if the following pipe in the grid has a connection to the left. 
If it does, then we add that pipe to the collection as well, as long as the pipe doesn't already exist in the list. As you can see, we're adding the pipe to a variable called pipe to add instead of appending it directly to the list. This variable is defined up here inside the loop and is set to none as the initial value. So as long as we find a valid pipe to add to the collection, we set this variable to contain it. Then at the bottom of the loop, we'll check if the variable is not none, and if so, we'll add its content to the list. We also have an else statement underneath the second if statement. This will be true if the current pipe in the collection can't connect with the pipe to the right of it, even though it has a right endpoint. If so, we need to stop looking for any more connections from this point on, so we break the loop. The next if statement checks if the current pipe is not in the last row, meaning it could be in any row above it. If a pipe in any of those cells has a bottom connection, and the pipe below it has a top connection, then that pipe will be valid in the connection made so far, so we add it to the connections list. If the pipe below, however, does not have a top connection, then the connection so far is invalid, so we end the loop. The next check is this elif statement below, where we test to see if the current pipe in the connections list is in the last row and has a bottom endpoint. If it does, then again we have a loose endpoint, which makes the connection so far invalid, so we stop the loop from continuing. In the next if statement, we check if the current pipe has a top endpoint, and if the pipe in the grid residing above has a bottom endpoint. If it does, then as usual, we add that pipe to the list, if not, we break the loop. We also need to check if the current pipe is in the first row and has a loose top connection, and then we break the loop here as well, if it does. The last check, in terms of creating connections, is testing to see if the current pipe is not in the first row and not the last in the grid. If that is true, then we check if this pipe has a left connection and the one beside it in the grid to the right has a right connection. Then we do the usual by adding that pipe to the list. If they don't connect however, then we break the loop. Now we have covered all the scenarios for which connections could be made. Now we just need to check if the pipe to add variable is not none, meaning it was set to contain a pipe according to an if statement above. So if it's not none, then we add this value to the connected pipes list. Outside the for loop, in the same annotation as the if statement that checks if the first pipe in the grid exists in the connected pipes list, we add another if statement. This one checks if the length of the connected pipes list is more than zero, meaning it has at least one item in it. If it does, then we check if the last pipe in the connection, which will be the last one in the grid, is not worded it correctly where it has the right endpoint. If it doesn't, then we remove it from the list since it would have been added before in the loop. Otherwise, if it is correctly rooted, it, then a complete valid connection has been made. In this case, the player has won the minigame, so we want to do an appropriate action. In this case, I have set Rempy to show a screen called Pipe Game Success. This is a screen that emulates the look of the default confirmation screen, but is a custom one instead. If you don't want the user to see a custom screen when they finish the minigame, you could instead jump to a label, for example, that continues the story of your visual novel. So here we have the end screen for the minigame. This is a model screen to make sure that clicks only interact with this screen and not anything below. Here I have styled it with two frames. One acts as a transparent black background and the other is a prompt that asks the player if they want to play again. In the prompt, there's two buttons. One says yes and the other says no. The yes button resets the minigame to be played again by first running the setup pipe game function and then hiding the screen. What will happen then is that the pipes in the minigame screen will be regenerated and a new valid path will be made. The no button in this case ends the game and returns the player back to the main menu. This is only an example action for this tutorial. You would of course want some other action here that will rather continue your visual novel rather than end it. But that's actually all there is to this minigame and this tutorial. To use it in your visual novel, I recommend putting this code into a separate file in your project and call it for example pipe minigame.rpy, but you want to of course leave the start label in your main script file. Then at any point in your visual novel, when you want to show the player the minigame, you can call the setup function for it first, and then show the minigame screen, just as I showed you in the beginning of the video. This you can do in any label you have, or in a screen, by using actions instead. A link to the complete script for the tutorial is in the description box below, as well as a link to the extended script which I talked about earlier. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.